Beautiful. Thank you so much, AJ. No problem. Here we go. So today I'm going to tell you guys how you can eat up, slim down, and get healthy. Does that sound good? I'm going to share with you the secrets to ultimate weight loss. The reason I'm so passionate about this subject is because I was either overweight or obese for over 50 years of my life. I first became fat at the age of five, and by the age of 11, I weighed 160 pounds, and I was not yet even five feet tall. Now that's obese. In my 20s, I ballooned up to almost 200 pounds, and I maintained a weight of about 165 pounds most of my adult life. The photo on the left was taken in 2003 when I was 43 years old, and I weighed 165 pounds. I'm wearing a brown shirt, standing next to a brown cow that weighs about 800 pounds. The cow is on the left. That's a joke. The photo on the right was taken in 2013 when I was, what was I in 2013? 53 years old, not very good at math. And I weighed about 127 pounds. I'm now almost 60 years old and weigh about 117. And I've been able to maintain that weight, a 50 pound weight loss for over five years now, easily, effortlessly, and deliciously using the principles that I'm gonna teach you today, which I'm really excited about. The secret to ultimate weight loss can be distilled into two words. It's not eat less, it's not exercise more, and it's certainly not gastric bypass. The secret to ultimate weight loss is calorie density. Calorie density isn't about counting calories, carbs, or points, or memorizing how many calories in a cup of rice or a half a cup of blueberries. All calorie density means is the amount of calories in a given weight of food. In the United States, we say calories per pound of food. So all calorie density requires of you is for you to know the average calorie density of a few major food groups. And we are going to create our own calorie density chart together right now. The foods in green are foods of which you may eat freely. These are the healthiest foods on the planet, the most nutrient dense, as well as the most calorically dilute. The foods in red are the least healthy foods on the planet, which I believe you should either not eat at all or greatly minimize. And the foods in purple, these are healthy foods, but they are calorically dense, so we need to be mindful of them. Again, calorie density simply means calories per pound of food. Now, calorie density has been around ever since food has been around. And as a matter of fact, several of the wonderful plant-based doctors use the principle of calorie density in their teaching. Dr. Dean Ornish, the first person who successfully reversed heart disease with a low-fat plant-based diet, wrote a best-selling book in 1980 called Eat More, Way Less. And when you understand the principle of calorie density and apply it to your daily life, you really can eat twice as much food and take in half as many calories. In 1995, one of my heroes, Dr. John McDougall, wrote another best-selling book based on the principle of calorie density called the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. But it wasn't until I wandered into a dollar bookstore one night after a movie in Burbank, California, that I found this book written by Dr. Barbara Rolls that the concepts really sunk in. You see, I'm a very visual person. And what I liked about Dr. Rolls' book, and by the way, Dr. Rolls is a researcher at Penn State University who has done more research in the field of calorie density than any other person. She actually studies human eating behavior in her laboratory. But she had a lot of pictures in her book. And if you look at the cover, you can see that for the same amount of calories as a huge bowl of vegetable soup, you would only be able to eat a couple of bites of a cheeseburger. She had pictures, for example, showing that for the same amount of calories in a quarter cup of raisins, which really isn't very much food, you could have two cups of grapes. And so this book really helped me understand the work of Dr. John McDougall and Dr. Jean Ornish. You see, Dr. Rolls discovered that all human beings eat the same amount of food per day by weight. Now, that doesn't mean that I eat as much as Robert Cheek, the famous vegan bodybuilder, but that all of us consistently eat about three to five pounds a full a day so that we can feel full and satisfied. Well, when you understand calorie density, you can not only con continue to eat the same amount of food per day, but possibly even more, and yet take in few and few and fewer calories. And you do that simply by changing the calorie density of the food you're eating. And if you do that by as little as, say, 500 calories a day, you can really safely, sustainably, effortlessly, deliciously lose about a pound a week without suffering, without going hungry, without counting calories, carbs, or points, or weighing and measuring your food on a plate. You know, let's face it, diets don't work. And I never liked that word. The first three letters were die after all. But 98% but of people that go on diets through a great deal of, of suffer, suffering and deprivation gain it all back within two years. About 66% in the first year and 
another 22% in the next year, but not if you use the principles of calorie density. So we're going to create this chart. And remember, food varies in calorie density from about 100 calories a pound to about 4,000 calories per pound. That's a 40-fold difference in food. So the first food group, and remember, now these are not individual foods, so you don't have to memorize a bunch of stuff. You just have to know the average calorie density of a few groups. But the food group that's lowest in calorie density, 100 calories per pound, are non-starchy vegetables. This is almost every vegetable you could eat with the exception of things like corn, which is the grain, and some winter squashes, which are a starchy vegetable. Non-starchy vegetables have 100 calories per pound. It's impossible to overeat on non-starchy vegetables. Unfortunately, Americans eat very few calories from vegetables. Americans eat over 92% of their calories from animal products and processed food, and less than 10% from fruits and vegetables. So the first secret to ultimate weight loss is to increase the amount of non-starchy vegetables you eat at every meal. It crowds out some of the higher calorie foods. It fills you up on fewer calories. It's full of nutrients, fiber, and water, and you just can't overeat on them. As a matter of fact, fruits and vegetables are about 90% water, and you almost burn more calories in the chewing and the digesting of them than you actually do in the eating of them. The problem is most Americans eat very little in the way of vegetables. So here's an example. And if you look at this photograph, some of the, of the items pictured, they're actually botanically fruits. So things like cucumber, zucchini, bell pepper, okra, tomato, and uh, what's the eggplant? These are actually botanically fruits. These are about 67 to 72 calories per pound. If you were to Google non-starchy vegetable, you'd get a list that looks something like this. You could literally eat a different vegetable every single day of the month without even repeating them. You know, this notion of eating vegetables has gotten so popular that Conan O'Brien has said that for the first time since 2007, the FDA has approved a new device to treat obesity. This amazing breakthrough is called a vegetable, and it's true. You know, they've done studies at Tufts University, and they've showed that the people with the lowest body weight and BMI are the people that eat the most vegetables. One problem with eating vegetables is your doctor will probably say something like, stop eating so many of them. I can't find anything wrong with you because as luck would have it, the food with the lowest calorie density is the food that's also highest in nutrient density. You know, most people that don't eat vegetables don't eat them because they don't like them. But the truth is, is we develop taste preferences for what we habitually eat. And there is only one taste preference that's inherent in the human being, and that's breast milk. Everything else is learned. You really can train your body to crave healthy food because what you eat today is what you'll crave tomorrow. So if you don't like vegetables, the best thing you can do is start eating them. It takes about 15 times to try a new food for it to become a preferred food. And there are ways that you can make them, such as roasting them without oil and things like balsamic vinegar and mustard, where literally Brussels sprouts will taste like candy. So start eating vegetables any way you can. But if you're wanting to experience weight loss, it's better if you eat your whole food whole rather than juiced and blended. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. You see, there's a concept known as RMR or BMR, resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate. And we need about 10 calories per pound of body weight just, just for our bodily functions to beat our heart, to breathe our lungs. So let's say you weighed 150 pounds and you sprained your ankle and you're laying in bed. You're still going to need about 1,500 calories a day just, just for bodily functions. How many people could eat about 15 pounds of non-starchy vegetables a day? I don't think any of you could. I eat between three and four a day, and it feels like I'm eating all day. But we want to eat, have you to eat your vegetables whole primarily, especially if you want to experience weight loss. Someone had posted this on my Facebook page once, no one has ever gotten fat from eating too much kale. And it's true. There's no way to get overweight eating vegetables. It's what we put on them, the oil, the cheese, the butter. This is what contributes to people being overweight. Now, the category of food that comes after non-starchy vegetables. It's about 300 calories a pound, but I'm actually rounding up. And what this is, is fruit. Now, remember, I just mentioned six fruits that are only about 67 to 72 calories per pound. And most fruit, especially the lower glycemic fruits like the berries and the apples, they're really about 200 calories a pound. But to make room for some of the starchier fruits, the bananas, things like that, that are of a higher caloric density, we'll average 300 calories a pound. But the truth of the matter is, is that if all you ate was fruits and vegetables, it would be impossible 
to be overweight. If you look at people that only eat fruits and vegetables, like our friend Robbie Barbero, or people that follow the 80-10-10 diet of Dr. Doug Graham, low-fat raw vegans, people that are fruitarians, this is all they eat. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's all you eat. You can certainly eat starches and other foods. But what I'm saying is it's impossible to be overweight or obese if you keep the average calorie density of the food you eat per day that low. So again, we want to eat, if, even if you don't want to become vegan, you still want to eat as many fruits and vegetables as possible because these are the, the foods that are most linked to disease prevention, disease reversal. All of the wonderful plant-based doctors will tell you to eat these foods and eat them freely. And they're delicious and they will help you lose weight and feel better. And they make your skin glow. People tell me my skin glows. That's the only thing I can think of. I didn't eat any fruits and vegetables till I was 43 years old. That's how I end up nearly 200 pounds with the beginning of colon cancer, even as a vegan. If you look at this picture, like for me, I would salivate. To me, it looks like candy. It's nature's candy. And then again, I didn't eat any of that for 43 years. And now it's, to me, it's, it's like eating sugar. It's so delicious. But here's why I want you to eat your whole food from a plant and eat it whole rather than juiced and blended. These are two identical glass jars, and they each contain 500 calories from products of apple. Well, there's whole apples on the left. Apples are about 200 calories a pound. If I weigh, I weighed out two and a half pounds of apples. That was about six apples. That's about 500 calories of apples. Most people would have a great deal of difficulty eating that many apples in one sitting. I know I tried, and after two, I was full. But if you take those whole apples and juice them, you get about three cups of apple juice. Now, it's pretty easy to drink that much apple juice, but there's something missing from the juice that's in the whole apple. And what that is, is the pulp and the fiber. Now, fiber is not only important to every bodily process. It tricks the brain into, into thinking it's full on fewer calories. It helps remove waste products and cholesterol from the body. It slows digestion so you feel fuller longer, especially on fewer calories. But where weight loss is concerned, it's the fiber in the food plus the water that together create bulk. And bulk is what creates satiety, which is that feeling of fullness you get that tells you to stop eating. The other problem with juicing, especially fruit, is that when you remove the fiber, what you've done is when you drink it and you increase the absorption. So what happens is that raises your blood sugar much more quickly than eating the whole fruit. And when that happens, your insulin levels get raised so much more quickly. And insulin is the hormone that's responsible for driving fat into the cells. So just so you know, no liquid calories are ever favorable for, for, uh, for satiety. You want to eat your food whole because chewing actually increases satiety. And so does looking at large volumes of food, which you'll get to eat if you eat in accordance with the principles of calorie density. People that have to weigh and measure their food on the plate, they're never satisfied. Well, for one, they're not taking in enough calories, but also skimpy portions. When you see them, you know you're not going to be satisfied. So this is just a wonderful way to eat if you're somebody that likes to eat large volumes of food because you really feel full. Everything you, if, if everything you eat has fiber and water together, which creates bulk, you are going to feel full and on fewer calories. Well, what about green smoothies? Now, this photo on the right, this is not actually a smoothie, but it's the same principle. This is apple juice, excuse me, applesauce. And I made it just by taking the same amount of 500 calories of apples and blending them in the Vitamix. Now, I love how Dr. Esselstyn, one of the stars of Forks Over Life, says we didn't exit our mother's room clutching the sharp blades of the Vitamix. We have 32 of the best juicers and blenders right Right here. So I'm not telling you never to have a green smoothie or that they're unhealthy. But what I am telling you, if you imagine that these two vials were your stomach, look at the vial on the right. Look at how the bulk has been artificially reduced. You are not going to feel as full eating applesauce as you will eating the whole apple, even though nothing has been taken out and the fiber and the water are still intact. And even though it won't raise your blood sugar and insulin levels as much as the apple juice, it still will raise it much more quickly than if you ate the apple whole. So what about dried fruit? Well, dried fruit is absolutely delicious and lots of people love throwing raisins and dates on their oatmeal or in their smoothie. And it's not that it's unhealthy, the fiber is still intact, but what have we now removed? We've removed the water. Remember, we want that fiber and the water together because they make bulk, which is create satiety. Look at the small amount of dried fruit you would get for the same amount of calories as six apples. So what is going to fill you up more? And realize that apples are only 200 calories a pound, but dried fruit is 1,300 calories a pound. It's more than six times as calorically dense. So it's so easy to overeat on dried fruit as compared to whole fruit. 
These are the four incarnations of Apple products. They each contain 500 calories. Imagine that one of these vessels was your stomach. What is going to fill you up more? The answer is always the whole plant food in its whole food form. All right, so the next category of foods, these are categories, remember, not individual foods. This is four to 600 calories a pound, and this is my favorite category of food, and this is the unrefined carbo complex carbohydrates, what Dr. John McDougal will call starch. So we'll break it down even further. For about 400 calories a pound, we have potatoes and sweet potatoes. This is where all the winter squashes are, like acorn, hubbard, delicata, butternut, kabocha squash. At about 500 calories a pound, we have whole grains, whether they contain gluten or not. These are things like quinoa, teff, millet, amaranth, oats, corn is a whole grain, of course, rice. And at about 550 to 600 calories a pound, we have legumes. These are things like lentils, beans, and split peas. Now, I didn't invent calorie density. As I mentioned, it's been around since food has been around. But what I think I've added to this conversation that has helped many of my clients is a vertical red line. You see, I didn't always know PowerPoint. And anytime I had a client come to me for weight loss, I would give the lecture that I'm giving you now on a whiteboard. I would write it out by hand. And one day I had, had a new client and I had given her this lecture. And afterwards, she scratched her head and she said to me, now, what is it that I'm supposed to eat? And out of frustration, I drew with a Sharpie a vertical red line, and I said, just eat to the left of the red line. Well, as luck would have it, research corroborates that if we keep our average calorie density to 567 calories per pound or less per day, which are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, the same four food groups that are on Dr. Neil Barnard, the founder of PCRM's Power Plate, most people can eat what's known as ad libitum, as much as they want, as often as they want, whenever they want, until comfortably full. Comfortably full is not Thanksgiving, I'm gonna throw up full, but that if you do that and eat to the left of the red line, you can get very close to your ideal body weight, if not uh, as, as slender as you wanna be. And this is to me the greatest news in the whole world. We don't have to go on diets or weigh or measure our food or count calories or carbs or points. We just eat, need to eat the healthiest foods on the planet as nature intended. And then we don't have to worry about when we eat or how we eat or why we eat or how much we eat once we understand what to eat. And these are the foods to the left of the red line. But what are most Americans eating that makes almost 80% of them overweight or obese? Well, they're eating mostly foods to the right of the red line and we'll go over them now. But first I'm gonna show you a few photographs of foods that are left of the red line foods. And these are all recipes from my book, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. These are delicious foods that, that regular people enjoy. I've tested my recipes on family and friends that weren't even vegan or, or health conscious. And these are all from my book, Oven Roasted Ratatouille, Bodacious Beet Salad, oh, Chipotle Bean Burgers, uh, Millet Salad, just so many delicious recipes, Roasted Brussels Sprouts, Oven Roasted Ratatouille, Carrot Cake Muffins. I worked with a restaurant in Los Angeles called Sharky's to create an oil-free left of the red line meal. It's called the AJ Bowl. They also have an AJ plate and they do have an AJ burrito, which is a low-fat burrito, but technically not to the right of the red line because the flour tortilla will be to the right of the red line. This is a restaurant in Los Angeles called Soup Plantation, where it's very easy to get left of the red line food. Huge salads with beans and peas, balsamic vinegar for dressing, huge baked potato with chives and salsa and fruit for dessert. And this was my first pass at the buffet. P these pictures were not taken with the intention of going in my PowerPoint, but people don't understand how someone that is slender like me can eat so much. But I'm telling you, I eat so much more now as a slender person than I ever did when I was overweight or obese, understanding calorie density. This would be an example of a lunch I ate on the holistic holiday at Sea Cruise, and that was probably not all that I ate. I probably went back for a little more. Here I am at the McDougal program with my first plate of food. And if you like to eat, this is the diet style for you. So the first food group to the right of the red line is 750 calories per pound. Now keep in mind that this is purple, which means it's helpful, but it's just calorically dense. And that would be an avocado. Now avocados are creamy and delicious and they're a wonderful whole food fat. And I'm not telling you not to eat them. I think if you're going to eat fat, I'd much rather have you eat avocados, nuts and seeds than oil, but you need to be mindful about something. What is a serving of avocado? Often when I give these talks on cruise ships or spas, people raise their hand and they say, one, two, a half. Well, believe it or not, I went on the website of the people that grow the avocados and sell them. So ostensibly, they want you to eat as much avocado as possible. And they said that a serving of avocado was actually one fifth of an avocado. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been able to take an avocado and cut it into five slices, eat one, and put the other four back and eat them later. If you can do that, 
you might not even need this presentation. But for a lot of us that identify as food addicts in any stage of recovery or emotional eaters, those high fat plant foods are so luscious and creamy and delicious that many of us consider them trigger foods. For us, they just perpetuate overeating. So for me, it's easier to avoid them than try to moderate the use of them. But if you can eat them a little bit, there's nothing wrong with them. Avocados are great, but just realize what a serving really is of these high fat plant foods. A single avocado can have as much as 30, 300 calories and 30 grams of fat. And we'll talk a little bit more in this presentation about how fat is a little bit different than protein and carbohydrate. So the next category of food is in red. It's 1,200 to 1,800 calories a pound. And in my opinion, no one needs to be eating from this food group, especially people that want to lose weight and especially children. And what we have in this category is the refined complex carbohydrates and dairy products. Now, dairy products are especially problematic because they're not only an animal product that are, that's deleterious to your health. And I would encourage you to watch Forks Over Knives or read the China study to understand that if, if you were only going to make one change in the direction of optimum health, that, that eliminating dairy permanently pr should probably be the first and foremost change you make. Dairy products are also so a processed food. But these are also the refined carbohydrates. And all food addiction, which is really refined food addiction, lies right here in this category of 1,200 to 1,800 calories a pound. Well, this is how I feel about that category of food because this is what made me fat and sick for over 50 years. And I struggled quite a bit because of my weight, especially in childhood. Now, for 1,200 calories a pound, we get ice cream, whether it's vegan or not. For 14 to 1,500 calories a pound, we have bread and flour. 1,600 calories a pound, we have cheese. And 1,800 calories a pound, we have sugar. Did you know that it takes three feet of sugar cane to make one teaspoon of sugar? I had a friend who grew up in Cuba, and once a month, her dad would cut her a little piece of sugar cane, and it took her all month to eat it. You know, beets are only a, about 195 calories a pound. They're a very healthy whole food, but you process them into sugar and they're now 1800 calories a pound. Whenever you process a whole natural food, you make it calorie rich and nutrient poor. Americans eat over 150 pounds of sugar per person per year. And I haven't had any since July 6, 2003. So somebody's eaten my share. You know, whether you eat sugar or not, most people understand that it's not a health food and that for many people, it even can be more addictive than cocaine or heroin. But try to take bread or pasta or flour away from people and they go crazy. After all, the bread, bread is the staff of life. We break bread with our loved ones. Well, here's the thing. Even if bread was healthy, at 14 to 1500 calories a pound, it's far too calorically dense for most people to eat on a regular basis or lose weight eating it. You see, when you take a whole grain, and you cut it with a sharp blade to make, a, a, now you have a broken grain because you're going to make flour, right? Well, when you ingest this broken grain, it has an increased surface area, which means it increases the absorption in the intestines. And when that happens, your blood sugar gets raised more quickly, which means also your, in turn, your insulin gets raised more quickly and insulin is responsible for driving fat into the cells. To give you another example, your stomach is about the size of a cantaloupe and it holds about a liter of food which is about 4.22 cups. If I were to fill my stomach with 500 calories of a whole grain like brown rice, which I do very often at dinner time, I would feel full. I would activate what's known as the mechanisms of satiation, my stretch, nutrient, and calorie receptors. But let's say I take brown rice and I mill it into a flour to make a, a bread or a dessert. I now need 1,500 calories to fill the same space in the tank, meaning my stomach. So again, processing the food, you greatly decrease the volume. So you have to eat so much more of it to feel full, which isn't such a great idea if you're trying to feel full on fewer calories and lose weight. So here's a breakdown again of the ice cream, bread, flour, cheese, and sugar. Just to show you some examples from jars, if these jars are about the size of your stomach, this is what 400 calories of cheese look like. I can't even fit 400 calories of potatoes in a jar. It's not even possible to fit a whole pound in these little potatoes. This is what 400 calories of maple syrup looks like. And this is probably, I don't know what, maybe a couple hundred calories of potatoes. Here we have flour. And again, I compare everything to the potato, my favorite food. So this is how I feel about this category of food. Alcohol would also, uh, come into this into play into this caloric density. So nobody needs to eat these foods. You'll be perfectly healthy uh, without them. And it will be so much easier to lose weight if you either greatly minimize or completely eliminate, eliminate the foods in this category. So this is how I feel about it. So I tell people, put, put this on your refrigerator as a reminder. 
So the next category of food is 2,500 calories per pound. And this food tops the list as the most craved food in the world when they do surveys, even by gentlemen. And that food is chocolate. 2,500 calories a pound. You know, a chocolate comes from the, the cacao bean, which is technically a seed. It was actually used in currency in the Aztec civil, civilization. And there are some marginal health properties to, to, to chocolate. It's high in antioxidants, actually higher in antioxidants than red wine or green tea. But the problem with chocolate is the company it keeps, which is usually full fat dairy and a lot of sugar. I want you to understand something because a lot of people say, at least they've said to me over the last 41 years, you know, Chef AJ, if I ate like you, I don't know if I'd live longer. I think it would just seem like it. Because everybody tells me, you know, everybody knows that chocolate tastes better than kale. I'm going to ask you, is that true? Whenever I give this presentation in person, I say to somebody in the audience, I say, who has a $100 bill? And usually somebody does. And I say, would you like to bet me that the reason you like chocolate better is because it tastes better? And nobody's ever taken that bet. You see, what you have to understand is that all eating stimulates the production of dopamine in the brain. But the more concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. And we have become addicted to this artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain because the higher fat, the higher calorie the food, the more dopamine is released. They've actually done studies with people that were self-professed chocoholics, where they brought them into the research lab and they offered them free access to as much chocolate as they want, every kind of candy cake, cookie pie, or ice cream. This was not an experiment done about weight. And so when they got there, before they unleashed them on this buffet, the, um, the investigator gave them an injection of a drug called naloxone. Now, unless you're a heroin addict, you might not have heard of that drug, but what it is, it's an opiate blocker that blocks the blood-brain barrier. So if somebody were to present in the emergency room with what could be a fatal drug overdose, they're given this medication so that they don't die. Well, when the chocoholics were given the injection of naloxone, and then walked to the buffet. They looked for their favorite type of chocolate. They picked up a piece, they took a bite, and they put it down, and they had no more interest in eating any more chocolate. So did the chocolate cease to become health, uh, delicious and creamy, or was the perception of what it was doing in their brain blocked? You see, people have to understand that most of us no longer eat for survival anymore, or even for hunger. We eat for myriad reasons, like we're angry, we're lonely, we're tired, we're stressed, we're bored, we're anxious, we're depressed. And so therefore, eating these foods to the left of the red line, which are less stimulating, which produce less dopamine, don't give us the same feeling as eating these high fat, high calorie foods to the right of the red line. So when you say you like chocolate better, it's because it's producing more dopamine in the brain, not because it necessarily tastes better. I know people that were raised eating to the left of the line, it never tasted chocolate. And I promise you, they get just as much pleasure from their food, but it does take time to neuroadapt from a higher fat, high calorie diet to a less stimulating whole natural diet. But I'll tell you, once you do it, you will love your food and you will love the results, which is greater health and a more slender body and a calm brain. So there's the chocolate, just looking at it makes a lot of us just salivate. I know that it's a delicious. The next category of foods, again, this is purple. These are healthy foods, but calorically dense. They actually range in calories from 2,800 calories per pound to 3,200 calories per pound. And these are nuts and seeds. But first, let me show you. This is 500 calories of M&Ms with peanuts. This is the kind of bag. This is just the, the small bag that you get, not even the movie size bag. And this is what happens. You put chocolate and peanut together and oh boy. That's a lot of dopamine, isn't it? You can get it from enough potatoes, though, I promise. So again, 2,800 calories a pound, nuts, seeds, nut butters, and tahini. Healthy foods, if you're worried about your omega-3 fatty acids, you certainly can do what Dr. Esselstyn says and sprinkle a tablespoon of ground flax seeds or chia seeds on your daily oatmeal or your salads. And if you're able to, you can certainly eat about an ounce of nuts a day. But the problem is, is they are very, very calorically dense. They're very easy to overeat on, especially if they're roasted and especially if they're salted. So you really just have to be mindful of them. I mean, I just look at nuts and I'm like, wow, that looks delicious. <laughs> this is what 400 calories of walnuts look like compared to about 200 calories of potatoes. And I always say, what's going to fill you up more? I'd rather eat more potatoes. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is what 400 calories of peanut butter looks like. Now, when you process the nuts into a nut butter, you even further, I'm so sorry, reduce the volume. <coughs> All right. Sorry about that. Now, for me, peanut butter is crack. I think personally peanut butter should be illegal. Just to give you a perspective, 
<laughs> this is an example on the right of something that I might eat for lunch every day. This is a delicious roasted Hannah yam that weighs about a pound and a half and four artichokes. And I will eat that for lunch on a daily basis. It's one of my favorite lunches. It has less than 600 calories. That piece of pecan pie all the way to the left is a pie that I just made at the True North Health Center for New Year's Eve, which we're allowed to have. It's made of two ingredients, just dates and nuts. That pie would probably be about eight bites of food by my mouth. That piece of pie has almost 700 calories and over, thank you, 40 grams of fat. What do you think is going to fill you up more? Hopefully you said the potatoes and the artichokes. So I thought that you had to eat nuts or you would drop dead. And I was eating only an ounce of nuts a day. I wasn't cheating. I was weighing and measuring them. And I could not lose weight just eating even an ounce a day. You know, if you understand the work of Dr. Rosanne Alviera, the geneticist at UC Davis, who talks about experiments she's done with her twin sister, who was 50 pounds heavier, overweight women are different genetically than women that have never been overweight and different than men who perhaps could eat a lot more fat and not only lose weight, but maintain the weight. I know that personally, until I went to a zero added fat diet, my weight didn't budge. But a year later, starting to eat potatoes, a food that I was always afraid of, that I was told was bad, that was fattening, this is the result that happened. Now, if you want to eat nuts, it's fine. But if you look like this little guy, you're probably eating a little bit too many. That's curly. It's a squirrel at our park here. All right. So 4,000 calories a pound. The food, and I use this term loosely, with the highest caloric density and probably zero nutritional value, is oil. All oil. Yes, even cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil, even coconut oil, which is 92% saturated fat, higher in saturated fat than lard. Now, this is a lecture on calorie density, so I'm not going to go into why oil is so deleterious to your health, but I would encourage you to rewatch the wonderful documentary Forks Over Knives to understand that or read Dr. Esselstyn's book, Prevent Reverse Heart Disease, so that you understand that oil is atherogenic, diabetogenic, and obesogenic, and that it, it, it injures the endothelial lining of your cells, which is the life jacket of, of your circulatory system. But in terms of caloric density, it is just too calorically dense for anyone that I know of to really lose weight eating or maintain their weight loss eating it. It's 120 calories per tablespoon. I can have two pounds of zucchini for the same amount of calories in a mere tablespoon of olive oil. This is 400 calories of olive oil, and you can see that it barely even registers in the jar. You could barely see it. Imagine it in your stomach. You can't even feel it. You know, they've done experiments at, at restaurants where they fed people food that had 500 calories more from oil. Like, for example, at home, I can make a pasta primavera with a gluten-free brown rice pasta, an oil-free marinara, and loads of vegetables. It maybe would be about 500 calories, and I could feed it to my husband and feel full and satisfied. They made the same dish in the restaurant, but they put oil on the pasta, they put oil in the marinara sauce, and they put oil on the vegetables. So the exact same amount of food was 500 calories more in the restaurant. No one could detect any more fullness. Those calories from fat slipped under the radar, undetected by the mechanism of satiety, and the people did not feel any fuller, but they did get fatter. So you really have to be careful about eating oil and eating at restaurants, especially if you have heart disease and if you are somebody that is concerned about your weight. You've probably seen this slide before, but again, these are your stomachs, and you can see that oil barely registers. It doesn't activate the mechanism of satiety because there's no fiber. It doesn't ac activate the nutrient receptors because there's no nutrients. And the only way it could activate the calorie um, re receptors is if you, if you ate an unthinkable amount of it. If you filled your stomach with about 400 calories of animal products, here it's chicken, it could be cheese, while it does fill the stomach a little bit more than the oil, it doesn't fill the stomach anywhere near amount that the foods to the left of the red line do, the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And so you could do this four, five times a day, depending on what your caloric budget is, and you feel full, you lose weight, and you get healthy. And to me, this is just like the greatest thing I've ever learned since, greatest thing since sliced bread. Now let's talk about why Forks Over Knives and my plan and Mastering Diabetes and Dr. Esselstyn's program and Dr. McDougall, why these are low-fat plant-based diets. You know, Dr. McDougall has been saying for over 40 years that the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And you probably remember from your high school biology class that protein has four calories per gram, carbohydrates four calories per gram, and that fat has nine calories per gram, more than double the caloric density, and alcohol is seven, which is almost double. This isn't a lecture about alcohol and its, it's, it's you know, pur purported benefits, which really 
are few. Uh, you know, the World Health Organization has issued a statement saying they can no longer recommend any amount of alcohol is safe. I'm just here to tell you for weight loss, it is not your friend. It is a liquid calorie, so it's not favorable for weight loss. It's a depressant. It slows your metabolism. You generally don't make the healthiest food choices when you're under the influence of alcohol. Most people don't go to the bar after a few drinks and say, hey, bartender, give me the steamed kale. So it's really just not favorable for weight loss, especially where women are concerned. It's toxic to every cell in the body. That's why they call being drunk intoxicated. And with every, as Dr. Tom Campbell says, that alcohol creates cancer in every cell of the body it touches. But again, just for weight loss, it is not something that's gonna help you lose weight. Now, here's the great news, <laughs> especially for people that are emotional eaters that really can't control the amount they eat. If you understand what to eat, you can still continue to eat emotionally if you eat the right food. You see, because human beings can't readily convert protein and carbohydrate to fat. That is something called de novo lipogenesis. Pigs can do it readily, but human beings cannot. Whereas the other hand, we readily, easily convert dietary fat to body fat. As a matter of fact, it takes only 3% of the calories in the dietary fat to convert it to body fat. Now, if we overeat on carbohydrates, for example, if we ate an extra baked potato one day or an extra serving of broccoli or two extra sweet potatoes or another scoop of rice, what happens is those extra calories get burned as heat. They escape through the top of the head or through the fidget factor or get stored invisibly in the muscles as glycogen. Now, these next few slides, these are not calorie comparisons. These are fat comparisons to show you how much more food you can eat if you don't eat added fats and oil. For the same amount of uh, fat in one potato chip, you could have four baby carrots. The same amount of fat in a traditional sour cream uh, dip on a cracker, you can have an entire tray of crudite with some fat-free bean dip. What's going to fill you up more? For the same amount of fat in a tablespoon of ranch dressing, you could have 10 pounds of cherry tomatoes. And you roast these cherry tomatoes and you think you're eating candy, let me tell you. For the same amount of fat in one chocolate chip, you can have five pounds of grapes. Freeze them. They taste like sorbet. The sandwich on the lower right-hand corner is from a restaurant characterized by golden arches. And as Dr. Hans Steele says, the more you eat at the golden arches, the sooner you'll reach the pearly gates. Or as I like to say, you can't have a million dollar figure eating off the dollar menu. That breakfast sandwich has 25 grams of fat. That 12 pound bowl of fruit has trace amounts of fat. You could have 13 apples for the same amount of fat is a fun size package of M&Ms. You could have a huge bowl of vegan chili or two bites of the world's smallest pizza. You could have a huge bowl of salsa, or you could have two tablespoons of guacamole. Now, I mentioned that avocado is not unhealthy, but what the problem is what most people think a serving size is. I was teaching one time at True North Health, where they don't serve a lot of the high-fat plant foods, but once a month, they'll bring a bowl of guacamole out as a topping for the potatoes. So on this particular day, where we have 11-inch dinner plates at True North, which are larger than the ones most people use at home, when people saw the guacamole, they were literally filling half their plate with guacamole. And Dr. Goldhammer said, does anybody know what the serving of guacamole is? And no one raised their hand. He said, well, I want you to know it's two tablespoons. And I said, per chip? And he said, no, per day. And sure enough, I went to the store and I looked at a package of commercial guacamole and it said a serving size was two tablespoons. If you can just eat two tablespoons, then go ahead. I can't. I'd much rather have that huge bowl of salsa. And you can bake chips by just taking plain corn tortillas and baking them in the oven. You don't need any oil or any salt, and they're delicious. You could have a huge bowl of fruit sorbet made in your Champion Juicer or Vitamix or Yonana's machine or the world's smallest hot fudge sundae. You could have a huge salad with a balsamic dressing or you put a little bit of feta cheese on it, and now it's seven grams of fat. You could have one donut or 71 oranges. Homer Simpson did not like this photo. You could have one peanut M&M or nine jumbo strawberries. And hey, if you want the flavor of chocolate, get one of those delicious reduced balsamic vinegars and chocolate flavor and, and drizzle it over your strawberries. One truffle or 26 oranges, one peanut or three cups of air pop popcorn. But I want you to understand that air pop popcorn is not a weight loss food. Air pop popcorn, like dry cereals and crackers and pastas, these are 1,800 calories a pound. You're better off eating the whole corn, which is 500 calories per pound. You could have two French fries or two huge baked potatoes. Or what I like to do is take those two huge baked potatoes, cut them into fries, put them in my air fryer, and now I have a huge plate of delicious, crispy, oil-free French fries.
So just to reiterate, the foods to the left of the red line, the foods in green, these are whole foods that are found in nature. They contain vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients. They also contain fiber and water. And remember, together, fiber and water creates bulk, which is what creates satiety. The foods to the right of the red line, in red, these are processed foods. They're not found in nature. They have few to no micronutrients. They have no fiber in water, and they contribute very little satiety. And the foods in purple, these are healthy foods, but they're calorically dense and they're best included in small amounts, in my opinion, after your weight loss is achieved. So does this program work? Well, I'm just going to go quickly through these slides. These are pictures of people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. We'll start with myself. You can see the lower left. This is an actual pair of shorts that I still have. And you can see these are all people that are following the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. Works for men, too. Works for couples. Just gonna stop here because this, this was my first client, Shada, who's lost 120 pounds and kept it off for over five years now. You can see the photo on the left, she's holding an alcoholic beverage. I call this photo from martini to bikini, which is another reason, ladies, we wanna ditch the alcohol for optimal health and for weight loss. This gal, Look at this, she was featured in Forks Over Knives. Heather, you might be familiar with her extraordinary story. So that's my book, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. I have 117 recipes, all low fat, whole food, plant-based, free of sugar, oil, and salt. That was my first book, Unprocessed, which does have a lot of the higher fat plant recipes, which are fine if you can, if you can eat them and, and be at the weight that you desire. I do have a television show, Healthy Living 13 episodes. They're now on YouTube if you like to watch it. That's my website if you'd like to connect with me. And once again, this is the magnet, which has all the various uh, components of these foods. So in my opinion, for optimal health, disease prevention and disease reversal, eat to the left of the red line. Thank you so much for watching. Chef AJ, once again, that was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. You know, as you were going through the presentation, I was thinking to myself, this is brilliant. We're, we're gonna build the calorie density chart together rather than just putting it up there and saying, oh, th these are the different foods. By actually stepping through the process, you really start to understand what foods belong in which category. And as a result of that, is it smart to increase, decrease, or eliminate particular food categories? It's absolutely brilliant. I really, really, really like this. It's great. Yeah, I think what happens, Cyrus, is people don't realize that, that – People are so obsessed with calories that they don't realize that it's not just the calories in the food that contribute to satiety, but it's the weight and the volume of the food, which is yeah. why things like soup, things that have water in them, it has no calories, but it has greater weight, which means that you're going to feel fuller. A hundred percent. And you know, you touched on that when you were talking about Barbara Rolls and volumetrics, and they said that the average person consumes the same weight of food per day. What is that number? Three pounds, four pounds, five pounds? Three to five pounds, but I'm going to tell you that while I was losing weight, I was eating between eight and 10 pounds of food. I don't yeah. eat quite that much anymore, but I was able to do it because the calorie density of the foods I was eating was so low. That's exactly right. Yeah. So rather than think, I mean, we've been told over and over and over again through marketing channels, mainly that, you know, the calorie value of your food is the most important determinant of your uh, ability to uh, achieve your ideal body weight. But just like you're saying, that's not important. It's, you know, calories are not the thing. It's, it's calorie density. And once you really fundamentally understand what that means, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, and you don't have to count or measure. It's, it's so freeing. It really is so freeing. Absolutely. This is, this is great. So during the presentation, I don't know if you saw it on your screen, but the chat box is going crazy. Wow. I, I did see something blinking, but I, I was so afraid to touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People were chatting in the chat box and, and there's 54 questions that I can see right here. And we're going to do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and in the Q and a section, which we'll do in a second. Um, but please don't go anywhere right now because before we get there, I actually want to talk to you guys about the forks over knives meal planner. Uh, now the forks over knives team, if you guys are unaware, the Forks Over Knives team, not only do I consider them very good friends of mine, but they truly, truly, truly want to make healthier eating easier for everyone. Uh, they, every single one of the, the team members at Forks Over Knives is mission driven and is really, just like Chef AJ, just like myself, we're here to really help you understand how to make 
better food choices so that it can totally transform your health from the inside out. Uh, now, one of my favorite tools that the Forks Over Knives team has created is their online meal planner tool, which I'm gonna give you a tour of right now. Um, I've been using it myself. I recommend it to every single one of my clients and it's brilliant. Of all the, the meal planners on the market today, I, I sincerely believe this is the best option. Uh, it's super comprehensive and you guys are gonna see that hopefully real soon. Um, we're actually, Forks Over Knives is running a, a New Year's promotion on this, on this meal planner. Um, and you can save 20% on the meal planner if you purchase an annual membership um, by tomorrow at midnight. So I'm going to go into it right now so I can give you guys a test drive of what it looks like on the inside. I highly, highly recommend taking advantage of this because it's, it's brilliant. So give me one second here and let's see what I can do. Okay, can you guys see my screen here? Chef AJ, do you see a video in front of you with uh, uh, Yes, it says plant-based meal planning made easy. Uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so here we go. So what I'm gonna do is uh, run you guys through this whole process because it's very, it's very cool to see how this whole thing works. Uh, so first of all, here's what you're gonna do. You start by creating an account. It's completely free and there's no credit card required in order to uh, try a free week. Uh, so what you're going to do is simply select how many people the plan is for and whether you have any food intolerances or preferences. Uh, I don't, so I'm just going to say click next. Now signing up takes just a few seconds and it doesn't actually require a credit card. There's uh, also a handy getting started video, which will give you more in-depth interview when you first join. Now the first thing that you'll see on is your meal planning dashboard. Every week the chefs at Forks Over Knives will send you a five-day meal plan with recipes that can be prepared within 35 minutes or less. You can also add sixth and seventh days if you choose. What I love most about the meal planner is that it is fully customizable. So I'm going to be away from home on Wednesday, which means that I don't want lunch. So I'm going to, I'm going to remove the pasta primavera from my meal plan. And I also, you know, I'm not really feeling like a seven layer bean dip or taco dip. So I'm going to choose swap. Uh, I can choose uh, recipes or I can simply type what I have in my fridge, which is tomatoes, lentils, and carrots. And here I'm in the mood for lentil bolognese with, pen, with uh, lentil bolognese with penne, so I'm simply going to choose that. Now, in fact, I want to have this on Tuesday instead, and I want to have the tabbouleh for lunch on Wednesday, so I can literally just drag and drop these meals to swap them around. Now, the wonderful thing is that the meal planner auto generates my grocery list and my weekend prep cheat sheet. So let's jump into my grocery list next. Here I can check off the items that I already have at home. Then I can access the meal planner on my phone or on my tablet when I'm shopping for the remaining items at the grocery store. You can also add your own ingredients to the list if you choose. Now finally, one of the features that I think actually makes this meal planner so good is the uh, meal planner, okay? The, the weekend prep cheat sheet. So here you'll see a weekend prep guide that guides me through the process of batch cooking and baking and freezing everything that I'm gonna need for the whole week ahead to, that simplifies my food prep and saves me money. Uh, and with one click, I can even print out everything into a handy PDF, as you can see right here. Now there's a ton more to explore in this meal planner, but hopefully you get a taste of what the meal planner can do. Uh, since tomorrow's the last day of their 20% off promotion, there's really no better time to try, 100% risk-free, which means that you can request a ref refund at any time during the first month if it's simply not working for you. I don't think that's going to happen because I think you're really going to like it. And it's an opportunity for you to make 2019 the healthiest year yet. So simply go to forksoverknives.com slash loveplants and score 20% off your membership today. I think you guys are really going to get into it if you haven't already tried it. Okay. There Sorry about that. I'm curious, how many of you guys in the chat box, tell me this, how many of you guys have tried the meal planner at some point? If you have, just write the word yes. Uh, looks like there's a lot of people here who have been using it, okay. Um, for those of you who have been using the meal planner, um, if you like the way it functions, if you feel like it's, it's adding value to your life, then write the number one in there. Um, I see this, then there's just a bunch of ones in there. I knew it, I knew it. Um, I use a meal planner almost every single day. Like I said, I recommend it to all my clients living with diabetes. And um, I can guarantee you, of all the meal planners on the market today, if you're, if you're looking for something that's going to save you time, that's going to simplify this whole process and save you money, this is the way to go. 
when it comes to questions and answers, let's get to them because I know there's a whole bunch that we want to get to. So, Chef AJ, first question for you is from Brenda. She says, what about plant-based cheeses or plant-based meatless meats? Yes. Yeah, so if they're I made from plants, are they okay or not? Okay, so I, I, and I, the word okay is a little bit ambiguous to me. I think of good, better, best. So somebody that's transitioning off the standard American diet, of course, eating a plant, any, even a processed plant food is going to be more healthy than eating an animal product. But in terms of your health and, and weight loss, these are still often very calorically dense foods. They often have a lot of fat and sugar and salt and oil. So I think of them as often useful in the transition or maybe getting families on board and children. But again, just based on their caloric density, Brenda, unfortunately, they're probably not going to be very favorable for weight loss. Okay, that's a great response. Susan asked, uh, in eating this way, how long is it reasonable before you actually start to like the taste of plainer food? It's That's been a few months. I'm still waiting. Is it going to happen at some point or not? So, so that is a great question. And you're talking about something called neuroadaptation. And if you're not familiar with that term, the best way to describe it is if you ever gone to the movies and you got there late and it's dark and you can't see. So you don't scream like, where's my seat? You, you stand still, your eyes adjust to that new level of darkness and you find your seat. Well, the same thing happens with your taste buds and with your brain chemistry. And if you're used to eating a diet that's high in sugar, fat and salt and animal products, it can take a while. I, I, I hate to say this because I don't want people to think, oh my God, I'm never gonna like this food. I've seen it take as long as 120 days. That is in the worst case. And this was a person that ate horribly her whole life, like literally a McDonald's eater three times a day. That doesn't mean it's gonna take everyone as long. Now, if you want this process of taste neuroadaptation to go more quickly, this is one of the reasons some people go to the True North Health Center and fast, not because they're overweight, but because when you fast on water and you stop assaulting your taste buds with so much sugar, fat, and salt, and then they give you your first meal of steamed zucchini, it's, you have like a food gasm because you can really taste the food. Now, salt, believe it or not, takes about 30 days. So if you're used to eating a lot of salt, and by the way, most people don't get their salt from the salt shaker. They get it from processed food. There's actually more salt hidden in things like bread than even on things like potato chips. But if you stop using salt, the food can taste really bland for about 30 days. But then all of a sudden, your taste buds wake up. And you eat something like char or celery, and you're like, my goodness, this is so salty. And there's so many seasons tricks that I can teach you to make food taste good without salt, you know, judicious use of condiments like balsamic vinegars and things like Benson's table tasty. But for salt, it can take about 30 days. For sugar, the truth is, is you're always going to have a sweet tooth hardwired to prefer the taste of sugar for, salt for survival, but you can learn to indulge that sweet tooth with the fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the whole fruit. But this is where wow. it can take some time is the fat. You know, Dr. Stilson talks about the down regulation of that fat receptor, and that can take, it can take 90 days. I'm sorry about that, but the thing is, is when it happens, and it will happen if you, if you stick with it, you can get, I mean, my, I, I eat sweet potatoes and broccoli almost every day for lunch because I like it. I love roasted sweet potatoes, and I'm not eating the orange ones. I'm eating the Hana Yam or the Japanese or the Murasaki or the Hawaiian, and I, I tell you, I, I just, I can't believe that I get to eat this every day, and, and it's so delicious, and yet, Yes, it's plain food if, you, if, you're, if you're a foodie, but I'll tell you, it will happen. Don't give up. It really will happen. Okay. I got three resources for you to back up exactly what Chef Eddie just said. Number one, the Forks Over Nice Meal Planner that we just talked about. The recipes in the meal planner are ridiculous. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of spice in these foods, and they take an otherwise plain dish and turn it into something that has a lot of personality that tastes fantastic. Number two, Chef AJ's book. The one that she just told you, she said that there's something like 120 recipes in your book. Is that right, Chef AJ? 117. 117 recipes in that book. I've had Chef AJ's food in the past. It is very good. Number three, right here, the Forks Over Knives Flavor Book. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this on the bookshelves. It just came out in the last couple of months. Darshna is a phenomenal chef, and she spends all day long, every single day, developing these recipes. So as you flip through these recipes – you will find mouth-watering options in here that really change the way that you might think of plant-based food. So if you don't already have this book, you don't have the meal planner, then I highly recommend getting some of these resources because they really, truly change your relationship with food and make you believe that a plant-based diet is not boring by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there's a couple of questions about oil. Um, uh, some people say, I eat out a lot. I go to Chinese food. I go to Vietnamese food. How do you eat out 
whether you're getting a salad or whether you're going to a restaurant and ordering something fancier, how do you do it and not get oil on your food? So, you know, I was a restaurant chef for five years. I was the executive pastry chef at Sante Restaurant. And I'm just going to tell you that restaurants use more sugar, oil, and salt than you ever would making a meal at home. And they do right. that because, you know, from what I told you about the dopamine, more dopamine, more pleasure, you're going to like their food more, you're going to buy more, you're going to eat more. And so the thing is, even if you can get an oil-free meal, you're not going to get them to change their cookware to change their water. So in other words, there's... I have found there's always going to be residual oil, uh, either on the grill, in the cookware. For instance, when they boil water to make your pasta and you say, I want it oil free, they're not going to fill another thing with, with water and boil it again. It's already going to, and I know this from the, on the cruise ship. They, I mean, all the chefs explain this to me. The restaurants don't have time to do that. So you're always going to probably get a little bit of residual oil from it. I mean, there's certain, there's certain restaurants like, for example, in Los Angeles, we have something called Harvest Bar. There's certain restaurants where they just don't put oil on a lot of their dishes. You really have to ask, and you, you might want to do what Dr. Esselstyn advises his heart patients is to say, I'm deathly allergic to even a single drop of oil. A lot of restaurants just don't understand that no oil means no oil. They think it means less oil. But again, most of the sauces are prepped in advance. So I'm going to tell you that it's really hard, in my opinion, to get an 100% oil-free meal at most restaurants. Now, of course, you can get a dry salad and bring your own dressing or ask for lemon wedges or balsamic vinegar. Sometimes you can get a plain baked potato at a steakhouse, but be careful because a lot of places rub oil and salt on it. So I do have a chapter of that in my book, but it is hard. You really have to ask questions. The best time to call a restaurant is between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. after the lunch, lunch rush, before the dinner rush. Be very nice and just say something like, oh, I, I've heard wonderful things about your restaurant, but I'm on a very special diet doctor's orders. Can you accommodate me? And find out. Some restaurants can, some can't. So I guess sometimes you just have to do the best. But the idea is, is especially, you know, especially if you're trying to lose weight, just maybe curtail the restaurants for a little bit because you really can get more food at home, cheaper food, and uh, definitely not have the oil in it. 100%. Uh, two questions here about grains. Uh, first question is, uh, is it important that I eat rice, whether it's white rice or brown rice? And then somebody all else asks, what is your take on quinoa? Hmm. Well, I'll start with the second question first. I actually love quinoa. I love the colored quinoa, the red one, the black one. I, I love quinoa because it's so fluffy. It can be used savory or sweet. What I love about it is it's the quickest cooking grain. It literally takes a minute in the pressure cooker. And I think it's great. Not that we have to worry about getting enough protein on a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. Or for people that do, it's very high in protein. Uh, quinoa is technically a seed. We, we think of it as a grain, but it's technically a seed. So as far as eating grains, there are some people that choose not to eat grains for a variety of reasons. The truth is, is what's so great about the plant-based diet is it's, it's abundance. There's no one particular food you have to eat. If you don't want to eat grains, you don't have to eat grains. You have to eat some, well, actually, I was going to say you, you have to eat some starch, but look at Robbie. You actually don't have to eat some starch. You could eat just fruits and vegetables. For me, that, for me personally, that wouldn't be as satisfying. And also, I'm sure with caloric density, Robbie probably has to eat way more pounds of food because of his caloric density being so low. So the thing is, is like with starch, if you wanted to see potatoes or sweet potatoes or winter squashes, you can do that. The truth is, is you can't live on grains and legumes because they lack vitamin A and C. People have lived on potatoes and sweet potatoes throughout history. And even in recent history, people doing experiments like Andrew Spudford Taylor living on potatoes for a year. But some people, for whatever reason, don't seem to do as well with grains. You don't have to. A lot of times people just eat one grain like rice or oats, but there's lots of grains out there like millet and amaranth and sorghum, you know, that, that people could try. Wild rice, for example, buckwheat, these are actually not grains, they're grasses, but these are also delicious uh, starchy options. I happen to love white rice. I don't eat it often. It, it's a guilty pleasure, but when I'm out, I eat it. I, I eat the brown and the black and the red, but for whatever reason, some people don't do as well with grains. That's okay. Just eat the starch of your choice in, an, in a whole unprocessed manner and you'll be fine. And eat it with lots of vegetables, of course. Okay. Uh, there's a really good question here that I think is applicable is it's i'd like to spend a little time talking about it actually because this applies to a large swath of the population and it especially hits home for me living with diabetes because uh most people living with diabetes have been told to eat a low carbohydrate diet if you don't have diabetes you might have also been persuaded to eat a low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet or the paleo diet or some version of a low carbohydrate diet so uh Diane asks, 
how can a person who was told to eat a low carbohydrate diet or somebody that has been eating a low carbohydrate diet make the transition? Is there something specific they have to do in order to actually enjoy this process and have it work? Well, you know, if, if they've been told by their doctor that they can't do that or they shouldn't, I know most people don't feel comfortable going against their doctor. So I would suggest getting a second opinion by one of the wonderful plant-based doctors. There's a website, plantbaseddocs.com, where you can put in your zip code and see if there's a plant-based doctor near you. And if there's not, Many of the wonderful plant-based doctors like Dr. Michael Clapper and all the medical doctors at True North do consults. And at True North, those are less than $100 to do a phone or a Skype consult. So, so I think you might want to ease your mind knowing that, you're, that you have the support of at least one medical personnel or one of the plant-based dietitians telling you that this is feasible, this is doable, and this is safe, and this is very effective. As far as how can you enjoy it? You know, again, if you're talking about taste neuroadaptation, that tastes time. So eat the foods you like. Don't feel like, you know, if you hate kale, don't eat kale. You know, find, find the foods that you like within the four food groups, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and eat them. And, and, and you can eat them in abundance and with abandon. You really can. And, and it's, it, you just have to trust the process and do it. And you will, you will love it. Try it for 21 days. You know, if you don't like it, you can always go back to doing what you were doing. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I like to think of this lifestyle as uh, forming a series of experiments. If you're willing to do a seven-day experiment to begin with and say, okay, I'm going to start to give up you know, meat products for the first seven days, see how that feels. Maybe the second week you start to give up more dairy products. Maybe the third week you, know, you start to transition slowly, step by step. If you perform small experiments, it makes the whole process of transitioning a significantly easier process. Uh, Spices, spices, spices. Mm. How do you use spices? What do you use? What are your favorites? What's the way to do it? You no, know, I, I, I wish we were gonna, I knew I was gonna answer that because I probably have more spices than anyone. And I shop at all the wonderful spice shops. It's not to say that I don't buy some of the spices at Costco or in bulk, but most, not most people, but I don't know where people live, but many people that live in big cities have spice shops at their disposal. Places like Penzi's, places like Savory Spice, and if not, you can do these online. What I like about going to these shops in person is you actually get to taste the blends, and they have multiple salt-free blends. I mean, I, I, I must have at least 50 types of spices here. Spice, spice, variety isn't the spice of life. Spice is the spice of life. My favorite spice is supposed smoked paprika. I love chipotle powder. I, I use a salt-free seasoning that I love called Benson's Table Tasty. Herbs make great spices. So, so garlic and onion, I mean, my goodness, you know, to me, that would be the hardest thing to cook without as, as a chef and somebody that doesn't eat a, a diet with salt. I mean, man, if you have onion and garlic and you, you saute it without oil first and caramelize it, I mean, that's the flavor. That's where flavor flavor comes from. Flavor comes from food. Salt is a very lazy way to season foods. You know, to me, chefs that rely on salt, that's lazy. That's what they teach you in culinary school. But there's so many wonderful splice, splice, spice blends out there, salt-free and not salt-free that you can be enjoying and tasting and buying online and buying in person. And again, fresh herbs will make things absolutely delicious cilantro and parsley and, and fresh basil i mean you know that's why you might want to take the forks over knives cooking class to learn how to season you know food it's a great call a great call yeah uh spices are make everything so much better um so we are gonna have to wrap up right here because i think we're out of time um but hopefully you can see my screen right now um if you are interested in trying out the forks over knives meal planner trust me when i say it's well worth it. Uh, again, in the next, uh, within the next 24 hours, the 20% discount will expire. Uh, go to forksoverknives.com slash loveplants. Again, it's free to sign up. It's free to try. And then if you want to upgrade to a premium membership, you can get 20% off if you sign up within the next 24 hours. So forksoverknives.com slash loveplants. Go check it out. Uh, convince yourself that it's something that's going to add value to your life. And, uh, you know, the, the Forks Over Knives Meal Planner follows all of the calorie, calorie density principles that Chef AJ just outlined in this, in this webinar. Uh, the meals are delicious. Uh, the Forks Over Knives team, and my guess is that it's mainly Darshana, uh, has put in a ton of work to make sure that this food tastes amazing and gets you phenomenal results. Chef AJ, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Well, thank uh, you. I, know, I learned a lot. I've, I've heard this talk multiple times, but I still learn a lot every single time. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank Absolutely. You for knives. And thanks, you guys, for watching.
Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for attending, and uh, we will see you next time. Have a great one.